Hey, it's been a while. My name is Oz, and today we will once again be dissecting the film The Lobster by Yorgos Lanthimos. When we last left off, we were just getting acquainted to the hotel's cast of characters with their many intricacies and romantically related issues. The next arc of the film is probably the saddest section for me as it introduces the Butter Biscuit Woman, a woman who represents the hopeless romantic who can't seem to find anyone. This begins with her infatuation with David on the bus to the forest in order to capture loners. When talking to David, unlike most characters, she isn't searching for a similarity in their personality or physical traits, but is instead simply looking for intimacy. In a weird way, she's one of the most sane characters in the film and actually displays more emotion than almost anyone else in both the way she speaks and in the way she acts. These biscuits are for Bob. I want you to give them to him whenever you want to reward him for something. Tell him they're from me. Thank you. Can I come to your room sometime for a chat? I could give you a blowjob, or you could just fuck me. I always swallow after fellatio and I've got absolutely no problem with anal sex if that's your thing. It very well also might be no coincidence that her room number is 180. If you recall, we talked previously about how David's room was 101, and how it very well might represent how the two ones are being kept from each other by the symbolic zero in the middle, which will explain how later in the film, David is kept from his love with a short-sighted woman by the loner group, aka the zeros. But with the Butter Biscuit Woman, she is the number one that is desiring a pairing, as represented by the number eight, which is a pair of zeros together. But on the other end, there is no one. She tells David that she will kill herself if she has nobody. In this case, it's less about her fear of becoming an animal, and more so an overall desire for sex. Maybe this overall burning desire is what's debilitating her from finding a partner, or maybe it's that all those who would be good for her have already been paired, as the pair in the middle of her room number may seem to represent. In the next scene, we see the trio of unlikely friends in what appears to be a training area. At this point, we get even more insight into the man with the speech impediment through his animal choice of being a parrot. I'm going to be a parrot if I don't make it. Why don't you become parrots too? And then we'll all be together. For me, this is the most important character-defining moment for this character. It shows that at his core, all he wants is companionship. He desperately just wants someone to talk to, and even though he can't always express himself fully, he still always wants to speak with people. This is why, after he gets turned to an animal, he wants nothing more than to still have the ability to speak. Furthermore, he wants his friends to become parrots too, so that he won't be lonely and will still have somebody to speak to. In every scene, he always appears delayed to speak with his friends, and it's this that makes his fate so much more sad. As we know in a later scene, he is shot with a tranquilizer dart, and is likely left to be killed, or captured by the loners. And while he was still willing to shoot David, it's his hesitation to shoot his friend that ultimately causes him to fall prey to the loners. You, you're like a brother to me. Oh, you're my best friend in the whole world. I don't think I'm your best friend in the whole world. You used to spend much more time with John. Oh, who's John? John, the limping man. Oh, yeah. I didn't even remember his name. But the man with a limp is on the other side of the spectrum. He's the faux charmer, that would leave his friends for a second for a relationship, and doesn't really mind if he has to lie and fake his way into one. This is seen in the following scene, where he fakes a nosebleed, just to have something in common with the aptly named and gullible nosebleed girl. If you haven't noticed by now, every character from the hotel seems to represent a common stereotype within modern romance. First, as we spoke on earlier, we have the Butter Biscuit Woman, a woman so driven by her desire for intimacy, but ultimately hindered by this burning desire. She is the tragic, hopeless romantic, the type that services like the hotel and subsequently dating services could never help, as her immediate appearance can deter people when they see her for only short periods of times. Which of course is what dating services and its symbolic counterpart, the hotel, is known for small red flags that amalgamate into the entire first impression of a person's personality. To contrast with the Butter Biscuit Woman, however, we have John, the Limping Man. Why John contrasts so well with the Butter Biscuit Woman is that while the Biscuit Woman is so truthful and honest about who she is and what she wants, 
John is constantly lying in order to achieve what he wants. John is successful, and the Biscuit Woman is not. The point is a very simple one. The film is trying to say that when it comes to the modern dating world, lying about yourself can get you much farther than telling people about the ugly truth inside of everyone. Thus, we will name John, the limping man, as the faux charmer. Next, we have the man with a speech impediment, who, as we just mentioned, is a person who simply wants companionship. Yet society around him looks down upon him for not constantly being in a romantic relationship. Moving quickly along, we have the nosebleed girl and the girl with beautiful hair. Despite their similarities, they also directly contrast each other. Where these two girls fit onto the spectrum of dating is quite clear. The girl with beautiful hair fits into the stereotype of the person with too high standards. This girl could have easily found someone in the hotel by simply finding a man with hair and considering it beautiful. But instead, she's insistent that the person must have hair at the exact same level of beauty as hers, thus leading her to become an animal. On the other side of the spectrum, we have the nosebleed girl who finds a partner simply by being naive. The entire meeting and relationship between the nosebleed girl and John the limping man can easily be seen under the lens of online dating. How often have you heard the story of the guy pretending to love some band they actually hate or love a sport that they haven't watched once in their life? And how often have you heard the story of the girl falling for a guy who's no good for her but she's swept up in his fake charm? Obviously, again, these are just stereotypes but in this film, every character is seemingly just a stereotype you would see on a dating site or app like Tinder. And of course, the nosebleed girl does end up pairing up with a limping man, and even later has a hotel provided child with him. What's interesting is that despite their relationship being built upon a lie, they seem good for each other, as though to say that lying to first make an impression in dating outweighs the original lie if it works out fine. Even in their first meeting, they bond quite well over swimming, and yet, the other guy has to force himself into having a purely physical connection with the girl, which further pushes this dating app symbolism. Once the nosebleed girl does get with John, and the girl with beautiful hair is sentenced to become an animal, we see a conversation slash farewell with both of them. This scene is again a great example of the dark humor in this film, and a representation of the multitude of levels going on in the film at once. In this scene, the nosebleed girl begins to read a very heartfelt letter, reminiscing about the times when they were single and comforted each other. While listening to it, we see cuts between the two and we're led to pretty much believe that the girl with beautiful hair is enjoying the conversation, which is stopped, of course, by an all of a sudden slap. The hair girl then says her last wish as a human is to watch Stand By Me, a film about coming of age and being there for your friends through thick and thin. This whole scene is here to display the common idea that single people feel betrayed when their friends begin to spend less and less time with them to be with a significant other. This is only heightened in the film, of course, due to the obvious issue of becoming an animal when you're single. This was even hinted at earlier with the following scene, which shows her having a delayed clap and her blank stare at the stage. Finally, we see the animal that the girl has become, and of course, it's an animal where her hair can remain, showing her vanity is prevalent even to the end. All of these characters cast a very broad range over the stereotypes of people in dating, but there's one integral person we forgot to mention, the jaded one, the person who really couldn't be bothered with a romantic relationship that contains heartfelt intimacy, but is instead content to be alone. This is a fairly common thing and is by no mean an issue, but comically the film does what it normally does and uses intense hyperbole to display this. This is how we get the heartless woman, who is depicted as the stone cold killer who gets no pleasure from human interaction. And it is with this character that we begin the downfall of David's stay at the hotel. Now, however, you might be wondering, where does David fit into all of this, and does he even fit into a stereotype? Well, to answer that, not exactly. I believe that David as a character acts as a stand-in for the audience member to project onto. Overall, David, while well acted by Colin Farrell, has no discernible character traits, and acts like a complete blank slate. 
In this way, the film reaches a whole new level of relatability. So of course, when a very neutral and normal person meets a heartless woman with zero feelings but disgust and disdain for others, we can assume that bad things will ensue. The heartless woman sees that David has emotion, which then leads to her killing his dog, aka his brother, which then leads to her seeing David cry, thus proving that he lied about also being heartless. After this, the heartless woman goes off to tell the hotel staff, but with the help of another loner in the hotel disguised as a maid, David is able to knock out the heartless woman and brings her to the animal transitioning chamber before making his escape. The film does not let us know what he turns her into, just that it's something horrible. I've racked my brain on what it could be for so long, but the film seemingly gives no clues as to what it could be. In my opinion, this is honestly better as it allows the spectator to let their mind run and think of all the many horrible animals it could be. However, maybe I missed a clue earlier on, and if so, let me know what you think she actually became. At this point in the film, we now have a major switch, where the film turns from lonely tale of people searching for love that mirrors a romantic comedy, to instead a twisted Romeo and Juliet story where the Montagues and Capulets are actually just a grouping of single people who like to bring down other single people to their level and celebrate their celibacy together. The rest of the film takes place mostly in the forest, and a little bit in the city, and because of that there is a lot less hidden detail found in the Maison Seine, which for the most part is what I look deep into in my analysis of film. So we're going to be doing it a little bit differently in the next episode, instead we're going to be just wrapping up the film and exploring the themes of how intimacy is treated and dealt with in real society, and how that plays into and mirrors itself in the film. And that's it for this episode. There's a lot more in the works, so stay tuned, and thanks for listening.